two voice actors enter. Both voice actors leave because they're best friends. Welcome to the booth with Mark and Austin on the one place you can listen to it, the internet. And rolling. Welcome to the booth, everybody. How's it going? Hello, hello, hello. All right, uh, I am Austin Lee Matthews. And I am Mark Allen Jr. And we are a pair of voice actors who like to finish each other's sentences. You didn't let me finish your sentence. You're supposed to be, who like to finish each other's, and then I say sandwiches. sandwiches. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so welcome to the show, guys. Um, Austin and I have been uh, friends for quite seven, a few years. Seven years now. And, and we've done a number of these podcasts of different... Uh, shapes and colors Sizes and, and, and all kinds of things. Yeah, so um, I, I, the first one was yellow, and the second one was kind of black and blue. Very roundish. Yeah, with yeah. like the um, a, a screaming guy and a punching sound in the beginning of it. Right. Yeah, yeah. you know. But we've, we've, we've done a few of these over the years, and we've never really done anything that highlighted the professional aspects of our careers and the things that we <laughs> professional. do. Professional. The, the <laughs> professionality with which we pretend to live our lives. Yeah, exactly. So we thought we would uh, uh, start a new show where we get the opportunity to talk about uh, what it is to be a voice actor and what uh, sort of our journeys have been and, and in the future perhaps bringing guests on or answering questions that people might have. Might, do, might like stream that. a couple episodes yeah. to get like some live questions and stuff. And I'm so glad that you said all of that because I would not have said that nearly as well as you did. <laughs> I would have said like, yeah, so we're here to talk about, um, I don't a thing with, um, you know, we're, we're, we're professionals and uh, <laughs> <laughs> literally me improvising anything in any booth when they're saying, okay, just go ahead and improvise a walla. Uh, <laughs> walla 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 walla. <laughs> so yes, we are both voice actors. Uh, I myself have been uh, doing voiceover now for just shy of eleven years, working professionally for just shy of ten. Um, and I've been doing this for uh, let's see, in two days from this recording, eight years, and I've been doing it. Uh, professionally, I'd say for maybe about, like, I started getting paid for it maybe, like, six years ago, but I really started, like, try, like taking it professionally maybe five or so years ago, I'd say, when I started uh, doing more regular-ish commercial work for, like, local radio and stuff like mm. that. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, we've both had similar but... Uh, different backgrounds yeah. in terms of what we usually do yeah. and, and have where we've been and who we've been wh wh who we've done what we've done <laughs> wait <laughs> well, phrasing um. <laughs> um and um just like I, I i think we pretty much have similar ish ideas with where our our careers are headed i'd have i'd say in some regards in yeah. some respects yeah i know that i want to do more video games and american cartoons um where would you say that you are headed in i that if if i could i mean one of the things about voiceover is that Work is scarce enough that you work whatever you get. Oh, exactly. Um, for me, my love has always been animation and video games. And in particular, um, I, I, I like, uh, shall we say, traditional original animation um, in terms of ensemble casts and, and things where you get the opportunity to play off of your fellow cast members. Um, I've had the opportunity to do some of those. I've also done some anime. I've done some video games. I've done some commercial work. I've narrated an art film. I mean, I've had the opportunity to do things pretty much across the gamut of voiceover stuff, but my love is always going to be in that sort of traditional ensemble-based animation style because mm -hmm. I grew up watching those kinds of shows like Care Bears and... Uh, um, I almost uh, started singing cats and things like. I that. almost started singing the gummy bears theme song. <laughs> I, I, you, you, you Not said, all bears are the same. You, you, you said Care Bears, and I you, you could see me like forming the syllables. Of, I started to go bouncing here, and there, and everywhere. <laughs> Care Bear stare. 
I, taste I, the rainbow. Honestly, honestly, as a kid, the Care Bears were the coolest thing to me. I like. I watched the Care Bears. I remember the Care Bears movie pretty well. Um, I, for, for me, when you said SWAT cats, yes, yeah, yeah, like I think that was the show that I'd say when I was really young, the show that I watched the most and just freaking adored that show. And I tend to forget that. Rob Paulson was one of them. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> and, but it's, it, but he wasn't he like the, he was the skinny one. Yeah, because I always forget their names. It's, I think it, it's like, uh, is it like Grease, Gruff, Griff, something it's like, like that? It's like Grease and Torque or something. It's something like, like that. that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I just, the only reason I remembered it is because he has, in the in the beginning of every episode of his podcast, he has the, you got a problem with that? Which is from <laughs> Swatcast. Um, but yeah, like I also had that same kind of. I grew up the same way. I grew up watching a lot of, oh god, SWAT cats, Animaniacs, Hysteria, um, Batman Beyond. I loved um, X Men Evolution. Mm. Um, most people don't talk about X Men Evolution. I anymore. loved X Men. That was a really good show. Uh, but a lot of those shows, like uh, the show that I often credit as being kind of like the catalyst of. Huh, maybe I kind of want to do that voiceover thing. Is um, SpongeBob SquarePants? Mm. Cause like I mean, I I was started off as more like an impressionist than a voiceover actor. I'd say because I mean they they can be hand in hand, but at more when I started, I wanted just mostly to be like an impressionist guy. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, I like I like saw like when I started out like when I was like fucking like six, um, I was like doing impressions of Steve Irwin, and uh, my my mother once said that I woke up when I was like four like in the middle of the night from a dream like quoting a Bugs Bunny cartoon. <laughs> I guess I was having like a dream and I was just like you're a genius, and my mother was just like what, and I was like I'm going back to bed now. <laughs> but yeah, um, but yeah, I. I, I've always been interested in that same kind of like the the traditional animation, but more recently I've been wanting to head in more towards video games and stuff because that's also been a huge passion of mine. Video games are a different beast entirely. Oh God, yes. The thing the thing that I enjoy most about video games and and uh, I've not had the opportunity to work on as many as I would like, um, or in particular I I personally enjoy uh, RPGs. And, and, and long uh, involved action adventure kind of games. I think I've done more video games than you at this point. At I this think. point, you have. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've I did a couple of really tiny fighting games way back when mm-hmm. that I don't think exist anymore. Um, and I did a couple other things, but my my what I'd like to do is I'd, I'd like to be in one of those longer running RPGs because for me. It's great to pick up a fighting game and be like, oh, I voice that character that everybody is beating up in the corner. It's oh, great. yeah. And that's so cool. But there's there's more uh, story and more character development generally in some of those longer running titles uh, like your your Halo series or uh, like the Persona series, for example. Both oh, of God, those are yeah. really good examples of where you have long running campaigns within the game where you get to see a lot of character growth and development. And that, for me... Is is always the the focal point for any role that I want to play. And RPGs have a lot of dialogue, probably more dialogue than just about like any other kind of game. I, I would say just about any other form of voiceover. Oh truthfully. yeah, but then even like even stuff like like you said, Halo. Even that, I mean, like those games run for like you know ten to twelve hours. So that's ten to twelve hours of unique dialogue that right. you need to record. And but more so than that as well, because you've got callouts, you've got you know mm. fight sounds, reactions to explosions. You might get like stuff that. that you don't even hear in one playthrough. Right. Yeah, and like and 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 if if the uh the directors are doing it right, you generally won't hear most of those sounds all in one playthrough. Right. Um and it's it's tough sometimes because there are games that like for example, I have I have a lot of friends in this industry and and I'd like to try and support them. So Mm -hmm. there are games that come out with my friends in them and I want to play them and I don't always have all the time to play them. Or the money. So I don't get to see, you know, the work that went into it and the stuff that they do, which is different from animation because with animation, a lot of times you can catch a half hour episode on TV or when the DVD comes out, you can watch it and go, yeah, I saw the work that you did. And now Netflix. Netflix as well. That's how I've ended up watching a lot of the anime that I and my friends have done. Mm -hmm. Um... That was basically how I like binged Moggy. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen all of um, uh, 
Kill a Killer JoJo's Bizarre Adventure yet, but because well, Kill- nobody's seen all of JoJo's Bizarre Adventure yet, it's still running. Well, yeah, but I, I mean like all the stuff that you know I did for it. Yeah, but like yeah, because Kill a Kill on Netflix isn't in English, but I I ended up buying one of the DVDs that I'm in there, so I'm just like yes, I have some proof that I've done this. Um, but yeah, like. With with video games, I've had the pleasure of just within like the last couple months working on a quite, t- a, few quite a few games. I think I've worked on since maybe like August of last year. Um, I've recorded, I think, oh god, um, maybe eleven different video games. I think. Yeah, you've, been, you've been working. Oh, it's special like in March. Last month I was my most successful voiceover month, and it's mostly because I was doing a shit ton of, of video games. Yeah. Um, and that's uh, that's ultimately where I really... Because I, I still want to keep doing like the commercial work that I do and the narration that I do for the Lessons in Joyful Living Radio mm-hmm. Network. Mm-hmm. Um, but ultimately where I feel like my career is heading, which I'm so thankful that it is is video games because that seems like that's where my strengths are and i love recording those because they go on for a long time i'm recording a game right now i obviously can't talk about it but i'm recording a game that's my first time recording like over multiple sessions we Mm -hmm. recorded a couple at the end of march and we're recording a couple more i think either at the end of this month or at the end of may um it's gonna be may sorry (laughs) Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> um, but this was the first time I've ever recorded a video game where it was an ensemble cast. Because mm. that's not It common. doesn't happen very often at all. Because they need to have like individual sound files for literally every character. So you have to put space in it. So it takes lo- even longer to record than regular ensemble sessions do. Right. And those already take a long time. Um for those of you who, who might not be familiar with what we mean by ensemble cast uh, or ensemble recording, typically, uh, especially in the modern age, um, and, and I would say more prominently within the last 10 years, you're recording in a booth by yourself, regardless mm-hmm. of how many characters are involved or how many people are on screen or anything like that. You, you get into a booth, you record by yourself, you record your lines, and then the director and editor later make it all seem like it's all working together. Ensemble recording is when you have, if not the entire cast, the majority of the cast in a room at the same time, and they all have their own microphone, and they're all reading their lines as the script goes on. Mm-hmm. That doesn't uh, that doesn't happen in video games. I mean, the the fact that it happens at all is still oh, yeah. a miracle because it's just it's it takes so much more time. But what you're doing is you're trading for uh, a an organic and 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 visceral experience as far as the deliveries go because the actors then have the opportunity to play off of each other Mm -hmm. and react to what people say and how they say it i was really fortunate that i got to record my first like um ensemble session for an american cartoon in december and i had never done anything like that before and it was just a blast getting it's a joy getting to work off of the the people who i was working off of they were they were great especially because one one of my i got to work off of one of my really like close one of my close friends who i've known for several years now since um since anime expo 2011 i've Mm -hmm. known this person and it was great because we got to really like work off of each other and it was it's sad that the industry's kind of moving away from that, but I'm glad that there are still companies that want that. Well, because some of them appreciate and understand how that changes the performance that you're going to get. But they are typically more expensive to produce. They, they are. And they're harder to organize because you yeah. have to match up everybody's schedule and make sure everyone's available at the same time. I still don't know how we managed to get seven people from that cast all on one. Because we got the entire main cast, one of the... Um, like one of the other reoccurring characters who isn't really like a main character, Mm -hmm. but it's kind of like the snooty antagonist kind of character. And then myself, who's just kind of like this guy who shows up for the, the one bit in the middle of the episode. Right. Um, so I, I, I I got definitely overpaid for that session. (laughs) Um, because I didn't start talking until maybe like an hour into that session. Um, but it was... It was a blast, and I was cool seeing that getting to come together like that. 
Yeah, my very first uh, experience with ensemble recording was for a show called Secret Millionaires Club. Mm. And I played uh, a recurring, not a recurring, I played a couple of bit parts in that show. So I had the opportunity to sit in on, was it two? I think two recording sessions. Mm -hmm. And um, I just remember sitting down in the room with the other people. And this was the first time I'd experienced ensemble recording, but I knew what it was. And I was just so excited to be a part of that. So for the first... Probably like an hour, like you said. Oh, yeah. I didn't have anything to do, but I, I was paying the closest attention I've ever paid in my life because I was watching what the others were doing, and I was paying attention to how much space they're giving each other, and just really enjoying the experience of being in a room with all those actors, all working on the same project. It's got such a unique energy to it that you don't get in any other voiceover session. Absolutely. Because, like, I've been in I've been in some really high-energy video game sessions. My first real, like, what I'd say, like... My, my first real video game session that I ever did was that I did in last August. It was, that was already like really high energy. But when I recorded for that other show that I wish I could say what it is, right. uh, but I, I can't unfortunately, um, it was a completely different thing. And by the end of it, like I was exhausted. I was wiped, but I had the time of my life. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, I'm addicted to this. This is this is my drug now. <laughs> um, and I was really happy I got to do that again last month for that game that I'll hopefully actually be able to talk about in June. I'll be talking about that. Sweet. Yeah. Um, so how did you really... Where did you get started in voiceover? Where did I get started? Yeah. Um, my very first forays into this magical play world we live in, uh, was uh, through a medium that <laughs> it's lost a lot of flair as the years have gone by. Um, and, and I'm talking about uh, radio plays and audio dramas. Mm. These were things that were really popular in like the 30s and 40s. Um, and even there were a few in the 20s as well. Um, Kind of died out in America, um, continued on in the 60s and early 70s in the UK. If you want some really good examples of like classic radio plays, look up the the Orson Welles War of the Worlds one. That one is phenomenal. You look, can also look up The Shadow. The Shadow. The, sh the Shadow. The Shadow News. Um, the Old Green Hornet ones. Mm -hmm. Oh, those are so yeah. good. But these were, these were really popular before television really picked up. Um, and once it did, obviously there was le there was less of an audience for listening to this, so gradually companies just stopped making them. Mm -hmm. But with the advent of the internet, radio plays kind of had a, a little bit of a resurgence. And like I said, I've been doing this for about eleven years. So when I started, what was it called? Like neo, like like neo style radio plays? Uh, I'm not sure what people would label them. Yeah. I, I just I just lump them all together. I know. Well, I know that you labeled Protocol as like neo something. Um, I don't remember what it was like. You like you gave it like a like a name. I don't. I don't might know. Might have. I don't yeah. remember. <laughs> but my so my very my very very first role in anything mm -hmm. ever one hundred percent was a show called Genesis Avalon. I was gonna say it's probably and, yep. <laughs> <laughs> I was. It's 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 an interesting story with that show because the I was cast as a recast. So there was a a, a character in the show who was just a bit part, and he showed up in episode uh, two. That's and how then I the did my writer, first radio play too. <laughs> the writer brought him back as like a, a recurring bit role, who then later on was going to have a bigger role. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to spoil it because if you guys want to check it out, I highly recommend it, despite it being some of my earliest work. But um, so I did this the 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 role as a recast, and then the show, which at the time was being independently produced, was picked up by a company called Pendant Audio Productions, and so they started over. So. As the recast, I came in and I only did episode five and maybe episode... No, we hadn't done six yet. So I did episode five and then was told, hey, we're starting from the beginning again. So you're going to do all the, the lines that the other guy already did because we're going to just redo it with you as now the, the voice. So I did that. And again, it was a bit part. So I think by like episode eight or nine, the, his role in the show was done. Um, but I became very close friends with uh, the writers and producers, uh, Kat, uh, Catherine Pride and uh, Kristen Bays. And um, we just, we, were, we had so much fun and we were bouncing ideas for a bunch of other things. Um, and I ended up coming back um, and playing another role in the show. 
Um, and uh, that was Dr. Evan Spencer, who mm-hmm. who who was the your a. Um, how do I say this? He was like the heartthrob doctor that you, but because it's audio, you don't really get to see him. Uh huh. So we had to like affect that he was <laughs> beautiful. It was an interesting experience. Oh, I but, bet. Yeah. Um, and and I really owe. Uh, a lot to especially uh, Cat Pride because I thought you were like I thought you were like in the middle of that sentence like caught yourself going like oh uh, <laughs> like, no, no, no. like 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 a, like a no. Jeff Goldblum thing <laughs> oh uh, uh, oh uh, 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 yes uh, uh, no um, no I do I owe Catherine Pride uh, a, a great deal of, mm. of of gratitude and thanks for my interest in this as a career because as a kid i thought yeah it would be cool to do voices for cartoons and stuff but i didn't really think that it was something that you could do as a job oh yeah and i didn't realize that until i had graduated high school i think we all kind of had that thing i think it's very different now for sure like people have more of an awareness of voice actors but at the time it was just not something that people talked about so um I I've kind of stumbled into it with not a whole lot of prior acting experience. I had I had a, a little bit of improv behind me at that point. I had taken uh, an intro to acting class in my senior year of high school mm-hmm. um, and started doing improv. Um, but I I really didn't know a whole lot of where to start. Um, so without Kat's dedication and 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 the opportunities that she gave me to. Uh, not only work on Genesis Avalon, but to audition for and work on other productions as well, um, really kind of drove the idea of of doing this as a career as opposed to just a pastime. Uh, so, Kat, if you're listening, thank you so much. <laughs> um, uh, he Mark's giving me that look like... Uh, you, yeah, how you... about you? <laughs> it's your time to talk now. Um, I got my. I had a very, very different start because you said that you had kind of the experience with like even like the like the intro to acting and improv mm. stuff. I didn't even have that. I w- when I was in high school, I wanted to be an animator, um, and I made a bunch of like MS Paint animations, and you can't find any of them because I didn't put any of those up. I well, I put up. <sighs> put up maybe a couple of them and I did some like old pivot animations but I decided oh you know what I'm gonna do my own voices for these cartoons instead of just making them just a bunch of random meme sound effects or everybody's favorite Microsoft Sam reading off the voices <laughs> no I... don't it is too dangerous to go alone <laughs> die, die monster you don't belong in this world <laughs> um but um I, I just I was I was doing that maybe just like a little tiny bit not really a lot I just kind of like was like really like really quietly like like talking like this <laughs> like <laughs> Every, everybody's first recording session goes that way though um and then I didn't really ever put those up but then in when I really started saying that I was pursuing voiceover um was in April of 2009 I was just like you know what. I want to try maybe doing some voiceover because I was inspired by the um, the Eager Raptor awesome cartoons. I was like, I want I want to do something like that. Um, so I audition. I looked up on YouTube <laughs> for um, auditions, and I found this audition uh, thing for a machinima called um, Odd Brawls, mm. um, which never really got made. But I auditioned for uh, three characters, and I got a very enthusiastic comment from the director saying, you, you got all three characters. Can you do three more? Um, so I auditioned, f- I, I auditioned, f- this was a, a, a super smash brothers brawl machinima. I should say mm. back when those were a thing. I remember those days, uh, the dark ages <laughs> 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 and the, the first like three that I did, I think I auditioned, they wanted, um, I auditioned for Ganondorf, Marth, and I want to say F- Falco and because they really they wanted um I don't, I don't know what they specifically asked for for Ganondorf but I just did an impression of Sean Connery <laughs> and be- because I was inspired by the old um legendary frog cartoons I don't know if you ever if anybody's if anybody remembers these but there's th- this thing called the return of Ganondorf mm-hmm. in which 
um, Link was like trying to convince everyone that Gan- when Gandalf came back, he was evil, and it was Ganondorf, and he turned over a new leaf, and he had this little, <laughs> he had this little stuffed Ganondorf named Ganny, and he says, "Come, Ganny, <laughs> let's go to the soup kitchen. There's hungry mouths to feed." And I saw that, and I'm like, "That's my Ganondorf voice from now on." <laughs> um, I basically just stole, the- I stole that guy's Ganondorf voice. And so I auditioned for this role with that, and I made they wanted Gamondor, uh, they wanted Marth to be really femmy, and so I made him like as like um flamboyant. I, I made him I made him as Mister Slave as possible. Like I'm super. Thanks for asking. And <laughs> that peaked the mic. Oh yeah, it was, <laughs> um, too, it was too much. It's too 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 much flair. So I I I, I did damaged. that. And then I just, and then they wanted Falco. They just wanted him played straight. So I just did the Falco with the Brooklyn accent. And I got all three. And then I auditioned for Wario and some other dude. Um, and I that's that's where how I started there. And that never got produced. But <laughs> that was literally that's what I attribute to like my first real voiceover experience. And then later that year I um, did some more stuff. I did some stuff on Newgrounds. Hmm. Um, new grounds. Uh, <laughs> those, those, that's a whole nother a story that's show. A, that's, a, that's another can of worms. Um, and then I decided, and then in, I want to say in 2010, 10. yeah, I, um, for one thing, I did the Anime Expo Idol for the first time. Mm-hmm. And then I started doing commercial work with a company called Voice Creative. And they do, like, stuff for, like, local and college radio stations all around the country, really. Mm -hmm. Um, I've even done, like, some real estate stuff for um, some stuff out, like, in Virginia. Um, And that's always been fun. I, I love working with Voice Creative. They're... Neil is super, like... He's super chill to work with. He's very flexible... Um, I always, you know, get in my stuff on time. He, he left me a really nice, uh, testimony for my website. I'll only ever say good things about voice creative. Um, and that's kind of where I, I, I started doing that. And that's where I really started making some money. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was when I was like, okay, maybe I can do this professionally and maybe make a living off of it. Yeah. And then in 2011, I did AX Idol and I made the finals. I think that was the moment where I was like, all right, cool. Yeah, I'm doing this professionally now. That was where I like really was like, all right, cool. I'm kicking it into high gear. For me, right after starting, and, and really right after Genesis Avalon, I said, okay, this is something I enjoy doing. And you know, I was doing a lot of stuff on my own as well, just stuff that I did for, for practice and for fun and with friends. And, and I said, this is something I really enjoy doing and I want to take this seriously. So I started dumping a lot of money into classes and workshops and getting the opportunity to work with other actors and casting directors and producers and things like that. Um, you know, I, I, I like to say I was one of the earliest students of the Bang Zoom workshops. I wasn't, Mm -hmm. I wasn't in their first class, but I think I was in their like third Mm -hmm. class. Um, I, I studied with, uh, Crispin Freeman. I studied with MJ Lalo. Uh, I studied with, uh, oh man, uh, it's a horrible time for my brain to just poop out. I think it's because you're, you're focusing on two things right now. You're focusing on remembering and you're also (laughs) focusing on my cat who is (laughs) demanding attention from Mark right now. Yeah. Um, She was just like a meerkat on her two legs, just like. Pet me. I demand the petting. <laughs> That's exactly what she sounds like. That's exactly what my cat sounds like. Um, but but even even outside of voiceover, I was taking classes. I was taking more improv classes. Um, I was involved with uh, a group of people that I had done improv with in high school, mm-hmm. um, and we were operating under the name Chameleon Comedy. Um, I did some sketch shows. I did some community theater. Um, and so I was really just dumping myself into acting. I was an acting major in college for a year. Um, and so I was taking, you know, actual instruction from professors and things like that. Um, and I really spent a lot of time hammering out and working on my acting chops because unlike you, um, I've never really considered myself an impressionist. Mm -hmm. Um, 
my the, the kinds of voices that I come up with are either things that I just hear in my head and I, I bring life to them, or I'm mimicking a person I've actually met rather than a celebrity. Mm -hmm. I don't have a whole lot of impressions of celebrities because that's just not my strong suit. I only have one impression of somebody that I know personally, <laughs> and it's one of my managers from my day job. <laughs> <laughs> But he's got like such like a unique way of talking because he he talks like this. He's got one of these like he's like okay everybody, what how are we doing today? <laughs> Let's go up there and we're gonna make a difference and have fun. That's a that's, that's a character, right yeah. There. <laughs> but that was one of the things that was really important to me in my early days of training and and Crispin Freeman especially uh, um, had multiple ways of saying this. He would say you know uh, good actors borrow, great actors steal. Mm -hmm. He would also say that you know. Even if you don't consider an impression good, it, if it doesn't sound like the person you're impersonating, it's still a character. Yeah, a bad impression turns into a new character. Right. Watch I Know That Voice. Uh, they, 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 will, they will hammer that into your head. They, they talk, like, again. well, because, like, I mean, like, there's a bit where they talk, where um, Hank Azaria, right, is, mm -hmm. is talking about how, like, three of his most prominent Simpsons characters that he plays are... Bad impressions. Bad impressions of Stallone, De Niro... And um, I think it's Joe Pesci. Yeah, Joe it? Pesci. Yeah. And, well, and then and uh, whoever Chief Wiggum is based on. Right. Uh, I don't. I uh, yeah. You know. I. But it's it's one of those things where you, you I because I practice voices and impressions in my car. Yeah. And then if I find something that you know I can do, I will do it and I'll re I'll record it. But if I find something that is a little bit off, I'm just like, well, I just found a new voice. <laughs> and see me, I. <laughs> Um, I'm sometimes I'm really mean about it. I try not to be. Uh -huh. It's unintentional. Uh -huh. But when I meet someone who has a unique voice, or in particular accents, accents and dialects are things that I, I tend to fixate on. Mm -hmm. And so I will I Me will too. spend and I've spent a lot of time trying to hone down certain accents. But um, if I hear someone who has a voice, I I have been known to uh, mimic them in response. So like if they're asking me a question. I might respond to them and accidentally do it in their accent or voice. Uh, and when I do it, I'm kind of like, oh, no. Uh, oh, please don't notice. Sometimes I get weird looks. Sometimes I get people going, are you making fun of me? And I'm like, no, no. Okay, let me explain. <laughs> there was one time when I was actually like, <laughs> I was doing it intentionally. <laughs> To our really our great friend Sean Chiplock, <laughs> um, and I love I love Sean I lo I I love him like a brother just like I love Mark like a brother, um, and uh, I just moved my hand away from my face. Um, <laughs> I wasn't gonna draw attention to it, but now that you did, <laughs> that's why I paused. Um, but we were uh, having a, a, a I think it was a double date uh, with. Uh, it was him, his uh, fiance, and then me and my fiance, um, and <laughs> I don't remember like what it was, but I just suddenly just started talking like this, and Sean was like, "What are you doing?" I'm like, "I'm like, what are you doing?" <laughs> and then he, and then of course his fiance is going, <laughs> and just and he, he's he's like, "What what is that?" And Mike was like, "What is that?" I'm Sean Triplock. <laughs> He's just like, that's not what I sound like. That's not what I sound like. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just doing that like the entire time we were eating. Just We were like at like some sushi restaurant and he's like trying not to make a scene. And it was really funny. <laughs> that's the thing is that a lot, of, a lot of us, especially now, a lot of us either started at around the same time or we've gotten to know each other over the years. Oh, yeah. And wh while I will say I don't do impressions of a whole lot of celebrities, I do do a lot of <laughs> yes. impressions of fellow voice actors. Yes, you do. Um, actually, my, my good buddy Edward Bosco, who will probably hate that I'm mentioning him, <laughs> um, he... <laughs> He's a very uh, avid sports fan, in particular of Chicago teams, because that's where he's from. No! <laughs> and, and just about every single person who knows him, by their second or third meeting, has an impression of Edward Bosco. 90% um, of us, it's just gobbles. Um, but... <laughs> I think I'm like the only guy who doesn't... Well, who doesn't have an impression of Bosco's like natural voice. I have an impression of... 
one of his characters that he mm. plays, but I don't have a impression of like his natural voice. Like, as I, I, cause I just love his, I love his con rod he, and killer he, instinct. He and I will oftentimes make fun of each other oh, to yeah. each other's faces in each other's voices. Well, that's, that's how you know that you're friends. Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> the fact that both of us are still alive isn't it is a testament to our friendship. Well, you and I did get each other all the fucking time. Yes, yes we do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, so it's, it's, it's just funny that the, and, and, and this is actually a, a pretty good segue because, uh, the community of voice actors that exists now was not in place 10 years ago when I started. Oh yeah. And, I, and, and I don't want to make that sound like voice actors weren't nice. We, we still were. Um, and, and people like Rob Paulson and Maurice LaMarche and Phil Lamar, they would get together all the time and have, have, um, because, they, you know, you see the same people when you work all the time. Oh, Eventually, yeah. you build a friendship. I was, uh, yesterday, I was um, talking to, to Billy West, and I mentioned that I had heard him recently on Rob's podcast. I was listening to some old episodes. And he just, like, went off just, like, on, like, on this, like, five-minute tangent, just like, oh, Rob is the nicest guy you will ever meet. Mm-hmm. And then it was, like, you could just see, like how happy he was to just know this man. Right. And that's honestly how we all are it about is. each other. It is. And it's it's kind of always been that way. But the number of people in the industry has increased significantly since I started. Oh, when, yeah. when I When I first started, the people that I was taking classes with, I was always taking classes with the same people. Mm-hmm. I mean, even going from you know a Bang Zoom group to a Crispin Freeman workout group to a workout session or, or, or a class with MJ, mm-hmm. I would see some of the same people in every single one of these classes. And it was because we, we were all kind of in that same place where we're like, we're we privileged few who understand that this <laughs> is a career. So, I mean, we... We all kind of got used to seeing each other's faces, and and our our circle kind of grew. And then I want to say maybe about seven or eight years ago, um, with the advent of more and more uh, like Pixar movies and DreamWorks animation and and voice work, uh, finally like kind of picking up and catching people's attention. Now suddenly everybody wanted to be a voice actor. Mm-hmm. So more people started to approach the career. More people started learning about the things that you could do to get involved. And so the the, the community as a whole just got bigger and bigger and bigger. So now oh, yeah. there's so many of us, but we all kind of know each other and we see each other frequently enough. That there's always somebody who knows like somebody you somebody know. that you know it's there's i've i've i don't think there's ever been more than like two degrees of separation between me and anybody else that somebody's talking about. honestly yeah um it's it's a very interesting and unique and, and very closely knit group because i guarantee you if you if you mention uh let's let's take nolan north for example oh just yeah it's the name that popped into my head you mentioned nolan north now we're in an era where people know that name. Yeah. Um, and people can go, oh yeah, he's the dude who played Deadpool in the game, or he's the guy that, that does Nathan Drake in in Uncharted. And there was a time, even as recently as eight years ago, where that was not the case. Especially with video game voice actors. Yeah, absolutely. Um, with some cartoon voices, uh, or people who may have done movies earlier in their career and moved on to voiceover, like you had... Um, uh, Mark Hamill, for example, oh, yeah. was really famously known for his work as the Joker. Um, but for the most part, like you had a few big names, and then under them were a good hundred or two hundred other people who all worked, but weren't commonly recognized names. Yeah. Now we're getting to a point where there are people who you know may have started working in voiceover two three years ago, and everyone knows their name. Just oh because yeah. There's so much more attention and media um, around voiceover and around projects involving voiceover. And the advent of like Facebook and Twitter has really helped that because I mean we all connect with each other somehow. Right. Like and word spreads around very quickly. And, too. and like as soon as I like meet like like a new like a new actor, I'm either following them on Twitter or if we end up like like hitting it off like like the group that I was recording with that that video game group, we all connected either on Facebook or, or Twitter. I know mm-hmm. that I connected with at least two of them on Facebook, those that actually had Facebook, um, but with everybody on on Twitter, um, and that's just made it so easy for us to to connect even outside of like those news sources, right? Um, and this is really, it's just, the era that we're living in is unlike 
really any other before it. Right. It's, it's well, it's it's a little bizarre for me sometimes mm. because there are people that I started taking classes with, people that when I started working professionally, they were working professionally, people like you and Sean and Ed Bosco, who I mentioned, who started after me. Mm-hmm. Everybody is getting these opportunities and these roles that are now getting press coverage. Yeah. And so it's weird. Like I just uh, there was a story the other day about Sean uh, uh, surprising a streamer. Uh, Sean Chiplock plays the voice of uh, Rivali in Legend of Breath Zelda: of Breath of the Wild. Yeah. And he, somebody tweeted at him, "Hey, this streamer is playing the game, and you play her favorite character." So he hopped in and and uh, was just you know really uh, engaging with her audience and her um, as she was beating the game and left her a very nice message and helped pay her way to I think it was Comic Con. Uh, or uh, some kind of it was, I think it was I think it was E3. Is it E3? I think it was E3. And 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 that's just Sean. I mean, Sean is is that nice. Sean of a guy. is legitimately one of the nicest guys I've ever met. Honestly, he's, he's a really cool dude. Yeah. And and but that that story caught a whole lot of attention, and there were there were websites covering it and everything. And so it's kind of bizarre to be in this place where I'm like, you know, like. Yeah, Sean. I know Sean. Like Sean's this guy. He, yeah. he does this and this and that. He's a cool dude. But like his name is like here and here and here. And you're like, wait a minute. Why am I reading about a close friend in a newspaper? This is bizarre. Um, and it's it's uh, I, I kind of had that a little bit earlier on in my career with Christina V mm-hmm. uh, when her work started kind of blowing up. Um, and it's just it's interesting to see how much more attention is brought to people who otherwise didn't get that attention, despite absolutely fantastic performances oh yeah simply because of the way that um media consumption has changed um and I mean, the advent like, of the digital age and things like that and like even now you really can't recall a lot of video game voice actors before maybe the late late 90s like i mean well like, because they're they're really weren't i mean i mean they, they were there but they were either like like didn't take credit for it or they used a different name or they were just somebody in the office. Right. It was a lot of like, times it was the developers or programmers. Like, like, like just try and think of like, what was the name? Like, like who was the first killer rings instinct announcer? I couldn't. Exactly. I can tell you mortal Kombat, but I can't tell you a killer. Instinct. Who is the mortal Kombat announcer? Ed Boone. Oh, there you go. I don't know that. And person. He, he was, <laughs> he was part of the executive staff. It was him. Yeah. And I believe Jonathan Tobias. Um, and the two of them were kind of the, the, the lead, developer guys um and when they decided they wanted an announcer ed just hopped on it and they used a dinky little microphone and they recorded it in a closet and well then a lot and a lot of the time those voice actors were just like the composer that grant, too grant kirkhope grant and banjo kazooie yes <laughs> and it is, i mean like <laughs> mumbo is literally him going into a microphone and saying come and come and have a go if you think you're hard enough <laughs> But of course, you know he was. Uh, how do you say it? he was like, "Come on, come on, up it, or if you think you're hot, you know, yeah. <laughs> or something like that." There, um, there are there are tons of really wonderful stories about how they kind of created the idea of voice work in back video, then, yeah. before it became this sort of dialogue heavy thing that it is now. I think really like the first dialogue heavy video game that I can think of that like like modern mm. is the first Halo. See, I would go back a little bit. Oh, um, um, he held up a finger to cut me off. Uh, Star Wars Jedi Knight 2. You Jedi could go Outcast. there. You yeah. could go there. I, for me, it was <clears throat> Final Fantasy X. Yeah, that... um, Final Fantasy X was, I think, the first time that I experienced really uh, intensive and engaging voice work in a video game. Mm-hmm. Um, there's so much dialogue in that game and, and recorded dialogue in that game beyond just, you know, fight sounds. Because mm-hmm. before that, like even in Final Fantasy 8 and 9, you had, you know, when they swing their sword, you get a ha! That's it. And that was yeah. about it. By, by Final Fantasy 10, you have, you have in-game dialogue, you have cut scenes, you have so many moments where the, the dialogue that normally you would just read is now being spoken to you. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was the re- really the first time that I experienced any sort of uh, extensive voice work in, in video games. Mm-hmm. I mean, if we're excluding things like Mega Man. <laughs> we always exclude Mega Man. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have to get those, the, those crystals before Dr. Dr. Wowie. <laughs> wow, that... Oof. 
Whew. <laughs> Again, that's a whole nother conversation if you want to talk about bad voiceover. Um, I would. The question I have now is, how different from where you started are you now? Um, like, like from, like from where you started and you saw your, why you, where you saw yourself going where you, mm-hmm. when you started and where you've ended up and kind of where you see yourself going from here. Um, I have always been, uh, a pretty big fan of Japanese anime. Mm-hmm. Um, it was a, a major part of my teenage years, um, my early college years. Uh, and when I first started doing voiceover, I was like, I'm going to be the anime voice actor. That is, I'm going to do all the anime. I'm going to win at anime. That will be me. <laughs> Mark um, wins anime. <laughs> it's confirmed. Um, and I do still really enjoy doing anime. And it's great to be able to have a, a hand in something that might affect someone the way it affected me. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, I think my my love of anime has kind of slid behind my love of voiceover in general Mm -hmm. Um, to the point where now I just want to be in the booth and I want to be able to breathe life into a character and in particular character work because commercials are more lucrative Mm -hmm. and certainly more sustainable as a, as a a career option. Oh yeah. Um, And so I will never turn down a commercial. Obviously not. But there is there is a joy to being able to create a character or to bring a, a uh, an artist or director's idea of a character to life that you don't necessarily get in anime because in, in anime when you're especially in America we're dubbing things into English which means that character has already been created already structured there are ideas that are already attached to that character so you you're not mimicking that you're you're kind of adjusting it or or. I don't want to say translating, but you're adapting it for a different audience. And in that regard, anime is really tough. It is. At- it's anime really is tough. Very difficult. Um, and and it, there's there's a joy in that challenge as well. Mm-hmm. But and and I know you you know what I'm going to say the minute I start talking about it. But one of my greatest memories and joys with voiceover work was working on a show called Clay Kids, mm-hmm. um, where I had the opportunity to to play a character. And again, this was another opportunity that I got because somebody else couldn't do the role anymore. So I was recast into this role. Um, and the way the character played, the way that he was involved in things that were going on, and his overall role in the show actually changed because of the way that I played him. Um, I was able to, to bring a, a different... Uh, dimension to the character than what they had originally envisioned and it in turn affected the writers and the creators of the project and thus changed his overall uh, I don't want to say importance but changed his overall role in the story and the things that he got to do he was a much calmer character when I got my hands on him Um, and just messing around in the booth and I mean we had one scene uh, early on in production where Motor the character that I play was supposed to be uh, a little upset and motor had always been really kind of low key and chill. Um, but the writers had written a particular sentence with three exclamation points at the end of it. And when I see that normally they tell you, don't pay attention to uh, quotation uh, quotation. Don't pay attention to punctuation. But when a writer writes three exclamation points, they're, they're doing that intentionally. You don't accidentally put three exclamation points. Yeah. <laughs> so just because that was the way I saw it in my first take, I went way over the top with that delivery. <laughs> and uh, MJ Lalo, who was directing the, uh, the production team, who was on uh, the phone with us in Spain, the engineer, everyone just died. They were rolling with laughter. And I I had stopped because I thought I had done something horribly wrong. And I heard the production group say, do that, more of that. <laughs> um, and from that point on, he became a little bit of a hothead. When somebody did something really ridiculous or something that he thought was very stupid, he was now very expressive about it. And it really changed his character just because of a choice that I got to make. And that, for me, has been one of the most rewarding experiences I've had because it allowed me to, one take a character that had been created for a purpose, um, breathe my own life into him that then in turn re-affected the creative team that was working on it. And so it became this uh, uh, organic kind of give and take between both sides of production that I've not really experienced in a whole lot of other uh, uh, productions. Mm -hmm. Um, And just because that magic moment hasn't happened and it doesn't always happen. Oh yeah. Um, 
And that for me, I think is what I enjoy the most is, is, is that feedback between everyone involved in the creative process. Um, and so by being able to breathe life into a character or to originate a character for a production, you really have an opportunity to make it your own and to really leave your piece of the puzzle that makes that project work in the, in the overall scheme of things. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, I, 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 I'm trying to think of if I've really ever had an opportunity to create a character in that depth yet. And I, you know, I think, believe it or not, it was for a video game that we were translating from Japanese to English, and there was already kind of that, um, there, there, there was definitely like some groundwork there for it, mm -hmm. but I made him the character that I play a lot broader. Um, it was like in the original Japanese, he's just kind of like this, really kind of toying, and he would occasionally throw a tantrum. Um, but then I'm just like, they, they when they describe the character, they're just like, okay, so he's kind of like this, this, uh, this game's Joker, and I was just like. Well then, I'm gonna go big. All right. <laughs> so, um, so the very first line, I was, I don't, I don't remember what I said, but I was just like, like, oh, how does that feel now? <laughs> like one of those, and uh, the, the director presses the button to turn on the booth, and I just hear the engineer going. <laughs> And then over Skype, I can hear the, the the guy on the other side who was kind of like co co directing. I can even hear him just kind of going, <laughs> and the director was like, "Yes, <laughs> one take, moving on." <laughs> that was a really that that was one of those like special moments where like by the end of that session, I like. I had a grin on my face that didn't stop, like, for two hours. <laughs> it was so much fun. Those moments are really rare, but they're really a blast when they happen. It's, it's, that's, like, one of those, like, special things. That's why we do this, It is. Really. It really is. Yeah. Um, same, same question to you, though. How do you feel that you've, you've changed at all, if at all? Well, I've changed significantly, because when I, when I started, I, I just wanted to, like be the guy who like was in, like doing like the impressions. I I think I came into it a lot a way that a lot of people do just like oh, I'm going to be the next um I'm going to be the next Bugs Bunny or I'm going to be the next right. like insert character that's had a long history of things here. Mm -hmm. And that's just like going into it like that is like the most unrealistic way of pursuing it. But um when I kind of got a hint more of like what voice acting actually was was in 2010 when I was doing Anime Expo Idol for the first time. And I, when I did, I was doing my monologue with Psycho Mantis mm. from the original Metal Gear Solid. And this is the year I, that I met you. Yeah. Uh, you, you were clearly like so distracted because you were... Uh, you you were I was running the that year well no well, you were but you were also organizing that get together uh, at, oh, at yeah. IHOP oh, and that you was a nightmare and you were like you were like so like uh, like you know aloof that night unintentionally so <laughs> um, but I remember I, I I came up to you and I was just like hey um so I'm not in the voice acting alliance I'm in the voice acting club. Uh, can I join you for a hop? And you're like, yeah, sure, whatever. Did I really? <laughs> yes, you oh, did. I feel like a jerk now. <laughs> well, it's because you were stressed. I'm like, okay. I, I was. That was that weekend was a nightmare. Oh yeah. Because I I do believe that I I think 2010 was the last year that I participated in AX Idol as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and so no, you participated in 2011. Did I? Yeah, you did. I don't remember. Yeah. I have the worst memory. You but did. Um, I know that I did participate that weekend and then i was trying to organize a meetup between uh two you did hollow ichigo in 2011 was that 2011 yeah I that was 2010 yeah okay whatever um but yeah no so i i was i was trying to organize a meetup between these two uh uh websites that were sort of amateur slash semi-professional voice acting websites mm -hmm. um and i was having uh, the hardest time getting a hold of people and uh, actually solidifying how many people were going to be there. We took over an IHOP in downtown Los Angeles. And, and, and when I say took over, yeah, I mean took over. Like they we, had to put seven tables together to fit all 34 We basically us. annexed a small micronation. They hated us. <laughs> they were so mad. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, no. I, I, I apologize on behalf of the mark of the past <laughs> that that was your first experience with me. <laughs> it was, I was not at my best that It's moment. one of those, that, see, and that's another way that you've changed from then until now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, like, I, because when I, when I did Psycho Mantis, I basically just just copied Psycho Mantis from the thing, which is like, you know, that's what you're supposed to do, right? Um, but seeing everybody else who knew what they were doing and was putting their own spin on these things, like, when I when I had gotten up there to do my thing, I felt, like, really just, like, oh, man. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. Felt, felt a little out of your league. And then when... When we when we when we met up later, like on Facebook, and we found out that we went to the same school, we, um, like you kind of like showed me more like what voice acting actually is, and then you also coached me for next year's the, the well the, the following year's AX Idol, um, and, and you really gave me the opportunity to make the monologue that I was doing my own thing because you picked this, an anime that hadn't even been dubbed at the time. <laughs> I um, remember that. I had to write that. Yeah, because well, you because you were watching a show uh, called uh, Kore wa mm -hmm. which I think I finally did watch the whole thing eventually before that. Well, and that. It's, it's been dubbed now as well. I've never seen it dubbed. Um, our buddy of mine, I believe, was that Cliff? I think that's Clifford... Chapin is the or Chapin is the lead in that. I could be wrong. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not really entirely sure. Um, but yeah, you you pick this and you're just like Austin. This is the because well, we had been looking for a monologue for a while. Yeah, and you said Austin, I found the perfect monologue. You're gonna do this one, and you picked it out. And you you coached me. You 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 really you gave I, me some really good feedback this, with that. It, and it might sound really conceited, but I. Spent more time working on you with your monologue than I did with mine uh -huh. because I I wanted you to succeed in it. I, mm -hmm. I wanted you to, like you had said, like you you didn't fully understand what voiceover was when I you really first didn't. went up. Yeah. So I wanted to make sure that you showed them how much you had improved and how much you understood, how much you'd learned in the year in <laughs> my, between. My absolute favorite feedback that I actually got from the final thing was. When I closed my eyes, you look so hero. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was my favorite feedback that I got from the final thing. But like, all, like honestly, um, that that was my first real my first real experience where I what I'd say with uh, in I wouldn't even say in the loosest terms of voiceover a teacher, <laughs> like like an, like a, like an acting coach, I guess mm. I would say because I really had no experience with acting before. What I just did was voiceover, right? Um, but with what we do, it's voice acting, little v, big A, right? Um, yes. And the voice, the voice is less than half of the job. Cause I mean, like with most of the stuff that I do now, like, like, like even in the video games where I play like five characters, a lot of those characters now are like so close to my natural voice because you generally don't hear them all like in the same part of the game. Right. Like, unless they're like a main character, like, um, like Erst and Summon Knight, which I can talk about. Yay. <laughs> um, like with him, like I... I was able to make him like my natural, my natural kind of speaking voice, um, and I had a lot of fun with that. And so I, I mostly now like, unless I, uh, unless I, I, I audition for the character with the specific voice, or if they say this is the kind of voice that we want, most of the time I'm just going to do my my natural voice. And that's most of the time what you're going to be cast. Yeah, exactly. As well. Like unless you're doing like. Like, like, really, like, most, like, American cartoons. If, if you're doing something really over the top or off the wall, then, yeah, there's going to be some vocal aspect to it. Like, there's a difference between Ed and Eddie, Uncle Grandpa, and then Steven Universe. Right. Cause, and, and that's a good example, because Steven Universe is very much a more uh, natural-sounding delivery for most of what they do. Yeah, because while Steven Universe is still sometimes a little out there, mm -hmm. they play it straight. They do. They, like there, there's maybe, part of what makes it work. There's maybe like maybe like two characters I think of where they play them a little bit less straight than everybody else. I would say Amethyst. Uh no no I would I would say um uh, uh what's his name uh Ronaldo Ronaldo yeah he's very much a character. R R R Ronaldo and Steven's dad. 
Actually, no, that's what he sounds like. Well, is that what he sounds like? Yeah. Then maybe, um, uh, oh, fuck, what's his name? The kid I hate, Lars. Uh, they, they, I, like, couldn't, I couldn't say about Lars. They, 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 they kind of make Lars a little bit more over the top than everybody else is. Yeah. But for the most part, I mean, like, Steven, even Amethyst, um, they play them really, like, like, like straightforward. Definitely later season, yeah. It's a lot straighter. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Was, well, like, yeah. Amethyst starts off really she's, kind of. She's, she's really rambunctious and over the top. Especially the when she was a purple puma. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Tiger Millionaire and Purple Puma are great. Tiger Millionaire. Um, but, like, when you get, like, into the stuff, like, like I, especially after Jailbreak. Actually, actually, I'd even say after Giant Woman. After Giant Woman, like, that's where I think where the show started really getting, like, okay, this is less, lo- less of a, like, a, of a traditional cartoon and more... A, a more story-indulgent experience. It's more, it's, it's very much a blend of... That American cartoon wackiness, but with like the natural delivery of like like an anime or a game or something like yeah, that. Yeah, that's fair. Or or I, even you know just like Batman the animated series, like something like that. It definitely it becomes a more serious uh, show with more adult overtones, and not adult in the wrong way, but I mean more mature overtones. Mm-hmm. Um. Um. Where, like like so, so now, like that. So now I am. Now that I've kind of established myself more as an actor, I'm doing a lot more of where, I, like, after 2011, I'm like, okay, here's what I want to do. I want to start doing maybe more games. I want to start. I want to start off in anime, and I want to segue into games eventually. Mm-hmm. And I started off in anime, and I kind of fell into games, and now I'm doing a shit ton of games and not a whole lot of anime. And I'm just like, all right, cool. This is where I wanted to be anyway. <laughs> uh, so it was, for me, it was just kind of like a, like, like, like a really abrupt segue into where I want to be. So this is where I want to be right now is doing these games. And mm-hmm. cause they're, they're fun. They pay well. And the, the, they're getting, it's, a, it's growing more. Uh, it's, it's still growing. Cause if if you look at where cartoons used to be and where they are now, cartoons have kind of hit kind of like a a plateau as as far as uh, things the, are. Well, well, the I would say that the the quality and quantity of cartoons that were being churned out uh, a couple of years ago really hit a low. Mm-hmm. I think it's starting to bounce back as uh, production companies and animators are discovering that cartoons don't have to just be for kids. So yeah, exactly. If you, if you can bridge the gap between your younger audience and your older audience, you're more likely to have a successful show. And I think that's really aiding uh, the cartoon industry right now a lot. Yeah, and, and, and games are still still growing. Right. Um, so it's cool being a part of that growth, and that's kind of where I see myself going in the future as being more part of that growth of that, um, that particular genre of the mm-hmm. industry. And then also I want to eventually start... Doing more American American shows because I've done one so far. Um, it's not out yet, but um, soon, uh, maybe <laughs> if it's even still being, soon-ish. If it's even still being made, I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> but um, so that's kind of like where I see myself headed. Where do you see yourself headed? You know, I over the last couple of years, my my journey through voiceover has been particularly interesting. And I say interesting, not unique, because I think it is this way for a lot of people, Mm -hmm. especially more so many years ago. I have not seen a whole lot of widespread success. I haven't really had what you might call a breakout role, Mm -hmm. despite how long I've been doing this. Mm -hmm. Um, Which has led to many a moment of self-doubt and many a moment of people thinking I don't know what I'm talking about. That was me the entirety of the last three years yeah it's, <laughs> it's it's not a fun place to be when it seems like everyone around you is experiencing grand success and you haven't gotten it yet mm. um but what that forced me to do is really look at what i want to get out of this career and what i want to get out of the industry um and in particular working on mass effect protocol mm-hmm. um and and wearing as many hats as i did for that production um i would like to if I were to put an end 
point in my career. Mm-hmm. Um, by the end of my career, I would like to have shifted into doing a lot more directing. Mm-hmm. Um, like I mentioned earlier, I really like being a part of the creative process and being able to uh, create this duality uh, between production and post-production and getting everybody to kind of uh, uh, work into a feedback loop where everybody's affecting everybody else's work um, and bringing out the best in, in all aspects of what's being done. Um, and I've had the opportunity to direct both Mass Effect Protocol and a couple other things, um, and I just really enjoy being able to work with an actor and getting a, a performance out. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not it's it's not the performance I want. It's the performance that's going to work best in the in the project and what's going to uh, make everybody look good, essentially. Yeah. Um. Um. And I really enjoy that. Uh, so I, can I, tell, I would love to get into more directing opportunities. I could tell when you were directing me in Protocol, every time that you've directed me in that, how much fun you were having <laughs> with that. Because like, like from even like outside of the booth, like when I got certain lines right, I could just see just that like... Like the, the 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 side of the mouth curl up a little bit. It's like yeah. I'm I'm a very expressive person. <laughs> yeah, you are. Um, uh, I think it was it was probably Ed actually uh, who was making fun of me because we recorded him as well. Uh-huh. And uh, he at the end of the session, I was trying to say without like giving him too big of a head. I was trying to say you did some really good work in there. And he he essentially said, oh, I know. And I was like, what do you mean you know? And he's like, oh, I could see every time that I did something right, you were nodding your head up and down. And I was like, oh, God. So I'm the bobblehead director, I guess. You, you're, you're a bobblehead and you have a really rubbery, expressive face. Gee, thanks. Um, no, that's a good thing. <laughs> You have the you you you, you 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 got a butt face and you move your head a lot. No, um, <laughs> no, you 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 are one of those guys. You're, you are like Jim Carrey in a lot of ways. That your that your face like just like you just did it right now because you just compared <laughs> me to one of my heroes. Exactly. What am I supposed to do when you? Yeah, you're um, getting hot in here. Or is it just me? <laughs> um, but yeah, it, it, like working with you because I've never had the chance to really work with you. In the booth, but on opposite sides of the booth, mm-hmm. it's it's really cool seeing the, the you you as you realize that shit's coming together. <laughs> yeah, because that it, makes that, that's a hundred percent. This is uh, and and I might not speak for all directors when I say this, mm-hmm. but every directing opportunity I've had, I've always gone in going, I have no idea how the hell any of this is going to work. Oh, yeah. So let's just do it and see what happens. So exactly that moment that you're talking about is when somebody does something that you're like, oh, that's that's exactly what I needed for this moment. <laughs> oh, this is going to work. One of my favorite quotes about not just the voiceover industry, but the collective industry, I want to say it was... Uh, I want to say it was... It was it was a it was a director and a composer. And I don't remember who it was. I want to say it was Hans Zimmer and Christian Nolan, but I don't think so. Uh, Christopher Nolan, I don't remember. Um, oh, and it, it was how how long until they realized that we have no idea what we're what doing? What we're doing? Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's that, it's really true because. It, it, I and spe- <laughs> I always go to protocol because it's the thing that, like I said, I wore many hats. I was the lead writer. I was the project director. I was the, uh, the vocal director. I acted in it, and, and I'm, so much of that show and product uh, project is my vision. Yeah. So I knew what was going to happen. I knew what was supposed to happen. I knew what I wanted to get out of it. And yet, when we got in the booth and I sat down to direct everybody, I had no idea. If it was going to work. And I'm sure that there's some other directors out there who get that. But because I, if I still can see, I guess I always have like one eye on this, on, on the, uh, on the script and my other eye kind of wandering off <laughs> oh, oh, my, my uh, intentional wall-eyedness walk, looking over <laughs> towards the outside of the booth to see if the director is nodding. Mm-hmm. And when I was recording a, for the game I recorded for in August, and the game I was talking about earlier where I did the over-the-top kind of Joker-ish character. Mm-hmm. Um, it was cool seeing both of those directors, like, like the smile on their face when, when, they, when they saw where I was going with a line. Um, kind of like the... Because the, the first one had a lot of yelling. Mm-hmm. And 
seeing like the the different levels of yelling that I could go because the first one was always like kind of like under the the second one was kind of in the middle and the third one I could tell that the third one was always the perfect because I always wanted to make that one the, the high the high the point of the, the the high point of the three the director just going like yeah bitch because mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we do we're we're desperate to make sure that everything is working oh yeah um, because if it doesn't we've really screwed up and then there's some directors who are just like so unexpressive that you can't you tell. have no way of knowing oh those are the worst yeah, uh, the, uh, the uh, director i worked with and they're um, brilliant directors they're absolutely oh, fantastic yeah, they're, what they they're do. fantastic but, but it's, it's you're in the booth like give me something uh, uh there was throw a, me a bone there's a game i was working on recently where this director he like like afterwards he was just like, dude, you did a really good job. You, 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 I could tell that you were having a lot of fun in there, and I can't wait to work with you again. But like the entire time, he was just like, like, like he was just like, like, all right, go, uh, and rolling. Good. Can I, can I, can, I, uh, can we get another one of those? Maybe just like uh, uh, a, a, a little, a little bit, uh, a little bit less. All right, cool. Moving on. <laughs> and you're like, huh, did I do good? Is it a good guy? Or- did, 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 <laughs> did I a <a> good? <laughs> Um, that's that's really a, an interesting thing too, is that being on on both sides of the of the the window, as it were, and yeah, getting to work with different directors is a trip in itself. Honestly, I'm I'm not sure if I'd ever really want to get into the directing position because I'm <laughs> I'm bad enough as a teacher. <laughs> I don't I, I don't know how I'd be like. All right, cool. Uh, do it. <laughs> I'll Let's you. suck this time. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's such an Ed Bosco. <laughs> that's that's Ed Bosco's I think directing. He's actually given me that direction he, before. Yeah, he well, he, he I think he's given me that direction too. When when um in the uh, God at one point in Protocol where he like <laughs> I don't remember like what the direction was, but he was like, "All right, cool. Here's what it is. Don't suck." <laughs> And then, um, and then afterward, like I could see, he was just like, "There we go, cool." <laughs> there have been a couple of Ed's. Ed's really, uh, he kind of fell into a, an assistant director position with the project with Protocol because yeah. I was dealing with a lot of of stuff uh, in real life and and trying to still get Protocol out and, and still working on that. But um, yeah, there was there were several moments where I wasn't either, either I wasn't getting what I wanted or I wasn't hearing something that I thought was going to work mm-hmm. and I would give three, four, five different forms of direction to try and guide them where I want uh-huh. and still not getting something and then Ed would be like I got you and he'd push me to the side <laughs> lean in and hit the talk back button and he'd say do it like this and he would give them like that that bit of, of direction that I would never have thought to give well, because what I get back is exactly what I was. Because he's for. Oh, it, 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 and it's a little intimidating because he stands up, l- puts his, puts <laughs> one hand on the counter, like just like the bitch, like, <laughs> like 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 one of those poses, and then puts like one finger on the button, like he like slams it down, like he's pressing like the like the the, the nuke button, <laughs> and, and and just and then he just goes for it, and he's just like, all right, cool, so. You, the, 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 you're, you're in the middle of a sandstorm and you're about to fucking die. Go. <laughs> and, and, and it's, I, I think that was almost word for word. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and part of that is because Ed knows me really well. Um, and he sat next to me while I was directing a lot of people for pr- protocol in particular. Yeah. Um, and I've talked with him a lot about what my vision is for the project and what I want out of it. Mm-hmm. So he, he knows more he about just, it than I do. He just, yeah. he, there are moments where he can tell there's something that I want Mm-hmm. And I'm having a hard time expressing it. And so he can simplify it so that other people who are not me can understand what it is that I am looking for. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and he's helped a lot in that regard. And he, he also directs me when I go in the booth. So yeah. he, he definitely has an understanding of what I'm looking for with that particular project. So I'm very grateful for those few moments when Ed is just like, Mark, shut up. I've got this. Um, so we're... Running a little long, but it doesn't matter. It's the first episode. I don't care. Um, if you have to, you can cut some stuff out. Yeah. Um, I, I probably will I'll probably just let it go. Um, but what would you say um, at this point, would you say is a, is a dream role that you've always wanted? Like it, it can be either a kind of role or it can be a specific character that you've always wanted to play. So there are a lot of characters. Whether they've been always, voiced before yeah, or not. There are a lot of characters I've always wanted to play. Um, 
I've always wanted to be Spider-Man mm-hmm. in one way or another. Um, I There are a few anime that I was always like, I want to be this guy in this show. And, it, and it, it wasn't always the lead. Sometimes it was like a really quirky side character or somebody who had a lot of emotional we've all, growth. Yeah, we've all had that, and I'm yeah. like, I want to be this guy. Um, um, but truthfully, when it comes to a, a dream role, a role that I, if I could book this role and I played this role, I would be happy with everything else that I did in my life. Um, and that would be to be able to originate a character that literally can change the life of somebody who's watching. Mm-hmm. Um, occasionally you hear about these stories of voice actors being met by a fan of theirs at a convention who shares a, a very heartfelt story on how something that they did helped them through a tough time. Um, I've had so many moments in my life where uh, either a piece of media that I really enjoyed or a movie that I watched at just the right time when its message really hit home um, and it's really helped me through some stuff, uh, some some tough situations. There have been so many moments of those that I want to give back to the entertainment industry, which mm-hmm. is part of why I do what I do. I think that's a p- part of why we all kind of do this. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, and it sounds really selfish, but one of my goals in life in general is just to have an effect on people, um, yeah. to, to be able to change people's lives for the better. Yeah. So, if and or when. I have that moment where someone comes up to me with a story like that. I will probably melt into a puddle of my own tears because it will be that moment that I realize, you know, all of the time that I've spent in this industry, the number of years that I have worked with very little recognition, the number of years that I've worked without really ever hitting my stride, um, it wasn't wasted. Yeah. That'll be that moment where I go, okay, I, I've, I've achieved exactly what I set out to do. Mm. Um, and that's, that's what I want. And it could be any role. It really could be. Um, somebody could tell me, you were soldier number two, um, and you were down in the, in the tar pits fighting, and you took a bullet to the shoulder and had to get carted off. Uh, and you only had like two lines, and it was, look out, and ah! And then they took you off screen. But that really resonated with me because this happened, and blah, blah, blah. Even if it was something as simple as that, I would probably lose my mind and cry. Oh, yeah. Because just knowing that anything that I did would have that kind of an impact on somebody is, it's just a phenomenal idea. And I've never experienced that. And again, it's probably really selfish, but that, that for me would be a dream role. If anybody wants like kind of like a, a taste of like one of those stories that Mark is talking about, look up. Uh, it's um, I don't remember the exact circumstances, but it's a story that Steve Bloom tells. Mm. I want to say he told it in was it Comic Con? No, I think he told about. I think he talked about it on Rob Paulson's podcast. Oh, did he? Okay. Um, and it was. Gilman really resonated with uh, a fan, and I won't spoil the story because I want him to tell it to you. I want you, to, I want... you can hear it in his voice how much it means to uh, him too. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a very heart wrenching. Steve, Steve is one of those guys who's just like the one of the nicest guys in the freaking world, and you can just hear it in just every every time he talks. Yeah. Unless he's playing Starscream, and in which case you can just hear hatred, <laughs> it's pure unadulterated rage. Um, and Logan. <laughs> so, but, but how about you? I know that that is a very uh, esoteric answer, not really well, anything concrete. But. Uh, f- well, I mean, for for that with the affecting somebody in in that way, I think that's where we all kind of want to be. Yeah. And so I'm not gonna I'm not gonna copy you and say the exact same thing because that's <laughs> honestly that's that's ultimately what we. What we all are kind of doing yeah. this for, we we kind of want to give back to um, how it shaped us as people and and how we want to kind of give that back. Um, but if I had to pick, like, like for a specific kind of role, I've always wanted to be the announcer in a fighting game. Um, and for, like, a specific role, um, at first I always wanted to be Spider-Man. Well... But fight to the death, brother. <laughs> but as I've kind of evolved a bit, a bit I, I think I kind of want to be more um, either Joker, not Joker, Deadpool. Wow, I was I'm still on that Joker tangent. From you earlier. are. You just stuck uh, in Joker. Uh, uh, Deadpool or oh god, um, probably like Nightwing. Hmm. Cause I, I and because I remember one time I did a 
so, some somebody said, "Hey, can you can you um just for fun tackle the scene where um Terry McGinnis is kind of um heckling the Joker in Return of the Joker just for fun?" And someone was just like, "You make a really good Terry McGinnis," and I'm like, "Okay, hmm, hmm. I don't think I'm ever gonna get to be Terry McGinnis, but I'd like to be." dick at some point <laughs> you know um and I, i'm sure that's also about as far-fetched as me being terry mcginnis but no, not necessarily but uh that's like i i, I think I, I would have a lot of fun specifically as dick grayson robin not I, I like either dick grayson or um definitely not jason todd because he's a bit more of a more, party more, pooper <laughs> Every party, is <laughs> um, but either 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 Dick or um, Damian Wayne, like like an maybe like an older Damian Wayne. Yeah. In I, I have to. This chair is moving on me. I have to say um, that I did think of another dream role of mine. Mm-hmm. I have always admired. Um, your ability to play villains. Mm -hmm. Uh, Even just when we're just joking around on the side um, or just um, improvising a scene just for fun, Mm -hmm. um, you always find a way to make villains enjoyably evil. I know that you liked my Asriel. Mm. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. And I think it's because you bring a level of humanity to even the most beastly of villains. Mm Mm-hmm. Um, and that's very hard to do. Mm-hmm. So one of my dream roles would be to play the hero opposite to your villain. We haven't had a whole lot of opportunities to work together. We really haven't. Um, outside of the ones that we've created. Well, even uh, even, so. even then, I mean, like, um, like when we recorded Mass Effect Protocol, we recorded our, we recorded our, cap- our characters separately. Separately, right? Like, like occasionally you would like provide the line for me, but I think. I can think of maybe one time that we ever really recorded something together, and it was balls to that, balls which to that. which never got produced. And you actually, we had an opposite thing where I was playing the hero, and I was and the you villain, were, and you were playing the villain. And I was the villain. You were playing a uh, general. General so, so which is balls, which is a, just a hilarious name. Everybody in that sh- in that freaking comic has just the funniest name. They do balls, mustard, general so, <laughs> uh, sergeant uh, olive. <laughs> Um, but, uh, I think honestly, that's like the one opportunity that we've ever really had and a, because it didn't get made and B because it wasn't in the booth. I don't really count it. Mm. I I, I want it to be in the booth in a professional setting where we're, where we're getting directed. Right. And I would love for it to be ensemble because we, (laughs) part of it is because we're friends. Yeah. So we, we play off of each other really well just in life. We're like brothers only closer. Well, I mean, without not physically, with, 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 like, without the like, for, we're not conjoined. At yeah, the without the protuberous hip thing, <laughs> like the, the, the pulsing hip thing. Yeah, we don't share a brain or anything like yeah. that. Our, our heads are just connected like bonk, <laughs> <laughs> and there's just like this this protubering mass just pulsating oh, between that's us. So gross. Yeah, but no, I mean, uh, and and seriously, because I, you have come so far as an actor, mm-hmm. and and I, it would be an absolute joy to be able to play opposite you in a show. And I, I feel the exact same way, whether it's hero and villain or, um, main character and best friend. No, I don't, I don't want to play with or... you in any other way. <laughs> I don't want any involvement with you unless I get to beat you up. That's really what my dream role is. Be- beat me up until, uh, until the point where I'm just like, <laughs> I, don't, I, I don't even know. Just like, and then you uh, reveal that you're actually my father, and it would mean something. <laughs> just like, Mark, I was your father. Wait, wait. So you would just breach the character entirely. And yeah. Like Mark, <laughs> and, the, and the director's just like, "Excuse me, Austin, that's not the. I'm bleeding out here. Please <laughs> send in help. <laughs> Call the metaparics. <laughs> Call a locksmith. Call the locksmith." <laughs> Um, on that note, I think we've pretty much exhausted a nice hour and a half here. Oh, geez. Has it really been that long? It has been an hour and 23 minutes. Everyone's going to think we like talking about ourselves now. <laughs> just just rubbing each other's rhubarbs for two hours. You leave my pie out of this. 
Um, but uh, thank you for listening to the first episode of The Booth. We're going to ho- hopefully be doing some more of this in the future. We don't know how regular we're going to be with this, but we'll try and keep it semi-regular. Yeah. Like, 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 not like you're, you know, having prune juice every day, but maybe once a week. Uh, you, you know, you want to keep your, your bowels semi-regular, but not, like, so regular that you can set a watch to them. Yeah, absolutely, definitely. Yeah, yeah so... Um, was that too much? So yeah, that might have been an overshare cut. 